we had a huge fight. Things were broken. <laughs> CVs thrown out of windows. <laughs> This episode of iFreaks is brought to you in part by Postcards. Postcards is the simplest way to allow user feedback from right inside your application. With just a simple gesture, anyone testing your app can send you a postcard containing a screenshot of the app and some notes. It's a great way to handle bug reports and feature requests from your client. It takes five minutes to set up, and the first five postcards each month are free. Get started today by visiting www.postcard.es. This episode is brought to you by CodeSchool. CodeSchool offers interactive online courses in Ruby, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and iOS. Their courses are fun and interesting and include exercises for the student. To level up your development skills, go to ifreakshow.com slash CodeSchool. Would you like to join a conversation with the iFreaks and their guests? Want to support the show? We have a forum that allows you to join the conversation and support the show at the same time. You can sign up at ifreakshow.com slash forum. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 64 of the iFreak Show. This week on our panel, we have James Zuber. Hello from Minneapolis. Alondo Brewington. Hello from Atlanta. Pete Hodgson. Good morning from Alamo Square. I'm Charles Maxwood from DevChat.tv, and this week we have two guests. We have Conrad Stoll. Hello from Austin. And Jeff Gilbert. Howdy from Austin. Do you guys want to introduce yourselves really quickly? Sure, I'll go first. This is Conrad. So I'm an iOS architect here at Mutual Mobile. I've been doing iOS development for a few years now. And uh, I feel like for the intro that I'm missing out listening, not listening to the intro theme. I think we gotta, we gotta pipe that in somehow. I've been listening to the podcast for a few months now and really have enjoyed it. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be on, get to talk to you guys. Yeah, and that, yeah, it's Jeff, also an iOS architect. Been doing iOS for about four years now. And I started doing Mac stuff way back in 91, so definitely a fan and familiar with the Apple platforms. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and talk to you all. Awesome. So we brought you on today to talk about Viper. Now, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with it, and I think uh, most of us have kind of briefly looked at it. Do you want to give us a little bit of an introduction to what it is? Yeah, so it's sort of an application architecture or a way of structuring your application. And it's based on uh, Uncle Bob's uh, clean architecture, if you're familiar with Uncle Bob. And it's a, uh, a use case centered architecture where you take your use cases, sort of the main features of your app, and that forms the center, this central point that you focus on. So that's sort of your core business logic are the, what we call the interactors. And then from that, you take your, your user interface, acts as a plug into the application. And we use, use the tend to follow model view presenter or MVP. And so your presenters are sort of the presentation logic that get data from the user, feed it into the interactors to process, and then it takes results and formats it for display. And then lastly, you have the views, which actually are basically your, are your UI widgets. And the main benefit of that is it makes it easy to split out your business logic and presentation logic, and allows you to use TDD to drive the development of those classes. So the full thing stands for view, interactor, presenter, entity, routing. And um, as Jeff likes to say, that's actually a backronym, which means that we came up with the term Viper first to fit view, interactor, presenter. And then entity routing, I think, describes all two additional components that end up being very important, which is how you model data, um, which is referred to as the entity, and then routing, which is sort of a, a way of talking about navigation. So how you transition from one screen to another, um, and that's where things like a wireframe class come into play. So there's a couple of different ways you can do that with Viper. Okay, so you just said a lot of terms that are probably outside of what a lot of the iOS community is used to hearing. Interactor, presenter is still kind of new. Routing. Can you give an overview of kind of what the, what these sections are? What, what are you talking about? So the interactor is basically your core business logic. Yeah, you know, that's the. Let's say you're writing a banking app, and one of the features is you want to transfer money from uh, one account to another. So the interactor would be the core business logic that is independent of any user interface. You know, that's actually the problem that has existed for the bank forever. Is how do you do this? And so the business logic involved in transfer money is you know you have to. You know, collect a from account and a to account and the amount that you want to transfer and involves things like making sure you have that much money 
you know, and the from account and all that. And so all those business rules don't care about the UI. And so, but they'll like maybe talk to databases or web services. So that feature you can uh, use TDD or test driven development to drive out the implementation and expose all the dependencies that you need, like a database, et cetera. And once you have that core functionality working, then you can wire it up to a particular user interface. And then so from that, you may uh, develop a presenter next, which is responsible for gathering input from the user and preparing it, getting it in a format that is convenient for the interactor to consume. And so the presenter is basically responsible for the, the interaction designer. So I don't know if you want to step back. And the, the way at Meet Your Mobile, we actually uh, have the luxury of large teams. Uh, so we actually have dedicated developers. We have interaction designers. We have visual designers. And, of course, we have our clients. And so I tend to refer to them as the business designers. I like that term, business designers. Oh, thank you. So in that sense, you sort of have the designers are the ones that are actually designing the solution. So you have your business designers, the client that have the real business need. You have the uh, interaction designers and the visual designers that design the UI. And then so they are the ones that actually are responsible for coming up with all the requirements of the system. And so once they have all the requirements, then it's up to the developers to turn those requirements into source code. So the in that sense, the interactor is responsible for the business designer. So the requirements that the business designer comes up with are implemented in the interactor. The requirements that the interaction designer comes up with are example of transferring funds between accounts. They may say, okay, I want to have, you know, let the user type in their account numbers and the amount, for example. And so all the logic of gathering input that data from the user and sending it to the interactor to process, and then the interactor will run its business rules or its business logic and then send the raw results back to the presenter and then the presenter then would format that in a way that's easy to display in the user interface. So, like, if you have currency values, you know, that's where you would use your NS number formatters to format that into a string. And then the presenter simply tells the view, here, display this string as the current balance. And so, again, so all the presentation logic in the presenter is also independent of, act- of any actual UI widgets. So it is also easy to... Uh, to use TDD to drive the development and the design of that class. What's the relationship between a presenter and like a traditional UI view controller? Are there still UI view controllers in this model or is it totally divorced from that? When you're developing the presenter, you'll sort of drive out a view interface in this in abstract view, not a UI view. And so your view may have things like set current balance, set account number or whatever. And then, so you'll have an implementation of that view interface, and that will be implemented as a view controller. Yeah, the the presenter, in effect, kind of drives the view controller itself. So the view controller, in you know, in single responsibility terms, the view controller is mostly responsible for layout and for receiving, you know, user touches and input. That's kind of what it's meant for, is receiving touch events. And so then the presenter is what knows, okay, this is what data needs to go where. So it has the ability to tell the view controller what actual string to, st- to display in a certain label. And then also when a certain event happens, like let's say the user tapped on a cancel button or a, a send button to execute that transfer, then, you know, what actually happens after that? It's going to then the, the view controller will tell its presenter, okay, this is what happened. And then the presenter can decide, okay, well, that's what that input was. A button was tapped. And so now I know I'm going to go take some action like executing a web service request. So it it removes a lot of that responsibility from the view controller and out into different objects. So the presenter is kind of the bridge in some sense between the, the UI and the core kind of domain application logic. Yes. And so it also sort of helps, it nicely conforms with the single responsibility, single responsibility principle. So you get the views are responsible to the visual designer and the presenters are responsible to the interaction designer and then the interactors are responsible to the business designer. In this approach, the entity is not seen by the presenter or the view, correct? Correct. The entities are only manipulated by the interactors. So the interactor may load up a number of entities from the database or web service or whatever manipulate those whatever 
however it needs to. And then when it sends results back to the presenter, it will use just simple data transfer objects or structures or, you know, just simple NS objects. And kind of one way where you can see that in practice is using something like core data that, you know, you may want to use core data for persistence and structure. You know, if you want to have an object graph with relationships from various objects to other ones, but you may not want to expose the complexity of core data to your UI. And certainly you don't want to have a lot of strong references out there to NS manage objects that could get kind of changed and invalidated out from under you. And so that's another case where the separation into layers and using data transfer objects to transfer information between the interactor through the presenter to the view is actually a really good architectural benefit that you have because you don't have to worry about having, you know, stale data and things that, you know, state that shouldn't really be persisted in that way. You have a little bit more control and flexibility about how data goes from your model layer through to your view layer. So would that be considered, in a sense, a view model for a presentation there? Yeah, 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 I think so. And a lot of these, from I'm I'm cheating and, and reading blog posts, the introduction to Viper blog post that's up on the Mutual Mobile Engineering blog. A link to that will be in the show notes as I paste it in. And it, it look from from reading through this, a lot of these kind of this isn't like a framework where you know there's a presenter superclass that you derive from or a interactor superclass. These most of these are just just regular old Objective C classes, right? Correct. Yeah, it's just more sort of a guidelines, sort of the the main concept to drive home is just the fact that you want to separate those concepts of your business design from your visual design and from your interaction design. And so even if you have a current project that has a massive view controller where you're sort of doing all that at once, you can even start to apply that simply with a current system by just, uh, say, if you have long methods that are mixing business logic and presentation logic, if you can just start to identify these are the parts, this is what an interactor would be responsible for, you can just start to pull out those methods, even if they stay within the view controller. You can just end up with uh, lots of smaller methods, each one targeting either the features of a of the interactor, the business design, or the presenter or their interaction design. And that would be a good first step. And so then once you have all these small methods, targeted at different responsibilities, then later you can start to pull those in into separate classes. What I'm I'm hearing from you reading between the lines is you're kind of modeling the architecture of the classes a little bit based on the people who are working on that area of the application. I think that's that's a really interesting approach. It's kind of like Conway's like using Conway's law to your advantage, right? Like saying these people are interested in this part of the application, so I'll shape the application so that the different parts are in different areas of the app. Yes. And, and so then when somebody, so say if the uh, interaction designer needs to make a change, you sort of know which class you say, okay, I need to go make that change in the presenter. And ideally, it won't have any effect, uh, certainly on the interactor, because the interactor doesn't really know what the presenter is doing. And it may or may not have an effect on the visual design. It sounds like this is just a really clean way to break up kind of the massive view controller like you were talking about. A lot of things don't really fit into MVC as soon as you do the things like talk to a web service. So the question has always been, well, where do you put this? Do you put it in the model? It always, but it actually always gets thrown in the view controller. So the interactor and presenter kind of break up different things that generally would go in a view controller and make it just you know, humongous. So presenter and interactor are two different parts of that. Yeah. So like if you're thinking like from the point of view of a view controller, the, if you think about the presenter, it's just sort of an implementation detail of what content do I need to display on the screen? And so. Since it is an implementation detail, you have the option of breaking that out. And then from the point of view of the presenter, you know, once I have data from the user, how do I operate on it? Well, that's really just an implementation detail. So you, that detail you can split out into an interactor. That makes sense. So something like with our banking example, maybe the user enters an account ID and maybe they just enter something completely wrong, but that would be maybe handled by the presenter. You know, if it's something that wouldn't even conform to a regular account ID kind of get past that layer and then go to the interactor and behind the interactor is maybe a web service which is calling to make sure they have money in the bank or something like that. Is that kind of how things lay out? Yeah, so like the interactor can be designed to uh, only operate on valid data and so it's up to somebody else to do that validation to make sure that only valid data makes it to the interactor and that'd be the role of the presenter. And so the views are rather dumb. They would be passive views 
in MVP parlance. So as the user types data into the field, it gets past the presenter and he sort of holds on to that state. And then when you say transfer, the presenter can run all of his validation logic to say, oh, this is, you know, you entered a positive transfer value or, you know, it can make sure that the count numbers are valid. And once it, once it is happy with all the inputs from the user, then it can pass it on to the interactor. And if not, then it can just present appropriate feedback to the user. So you're talking about MVP, which is model view presenter. Yes. Do you draw a distinction between that and like MVVM, model view, view model? Do you think they all get kind of balled together or do you make a distinction? Not really. And as you say, the whole UI just, so the together, the view and the presenter work together to implement the UI and the whole UI acts as a plugin to the application, but the interactor is actually being the application itself. And so if at that point, if you don't want to use MVP, if you want to maybe use MVC just as a presentation architecture or MVVM, it's uh, certainly would be easy enough to just plug those into the uh, interactor instead. Hmm, okay. And these these interactors are more like if if I was coming in it from a domain driven design parlance, I guess they're they're like services, right? They're not like domain objects representing an account or a user. They're more verbs than nouns. Is that accurate? Yeah, basically, they're the implementation of a user story. So they're basically your application logic. I, I like the uh, analogy to domain-driven design. That's kind of one of the ways that I think about some of the inspiration behind this. I think that when if you're designing for a specific screen, um, like let's use the example of the transfer screen again, you can think of it very much from a domain-driven design standpoint. And, you know, there will be... Certainly some model objects indicate like a transfer or an account or things like that. And then the interactor is certainly going to be built around the goal that the user is trying to achieve on that particular screen. And then the presenter is going to be all about making sure that the data related to allowing the user to reach that goal is presented and formatted and displayed in the appropriate way. So I I think that the domain-driven design sort of philosophy definitely still applies here. I guess I'm still trying to make sure I understand all this stuff, so I'm going to keep on asking silly questions. Um, Maybe not silly. The entities, are those more like domain objects in the the DDD kind of sense of like a, a rich domain object, like an entity in that sense, or are they something that's just kind of an interface? Do they map directly to kind of like core data or something like that? Yeah, they're probably what most people classically refer to as model objects. Again, most of this terminology of views, interactors, presenters, and entities it comes from the uh, clean architecture as defined by Uncle Bob. And uh, in that, so basically entities would contain, yeah, you know, so they're, they're your model objects, and they would contain any application-independent business logic. So if this model object were to be, or this entity were to be, were to be used in multiple applications, then sort of that bit of logic that would be useful across all those applications would be in the entity. But then any application dependent business logic that's will belong to the interactor. So one interesting application of this is if you consider an, an iOS app that needs to work across iPhone and iPad and leaving aside some of the adaptive UI principles from iOS 8 and WWDC this year, let's say that there is a case where you have to provide a different UI implementation for iPhone versus iPad. But most likely what's going to be the case is that your business logic and everything surrounding that for the actual feature will likely be the same. Just the visual implementation will be different. Um, In that case, you can use the same interactor to implement the business use case and have a different presenter and view um, which will end up being a different view controller to actually implement the feature visually. So I think that's one case where we've seen a lot of benefit to using Viper is in projects that we know need to support that type of a, a structure. Interesting. Would that be the case even if... So I'm sure that you'd still be able to reuse a lot of this stuff, but in the example where, let's say... On an i, so we'll keep we'll keep using our account our banking application example. Let's say you've got like a free on an iPhone a free screen kind of flow to to transfer money. So you have to select some stuff and then go to the next screen and then select type in some values or something and then go to the next screen and confirm your payment. But then on the iPad you've got extra screen real estate so you can shrink it down into two screens. 
would that still would you still be able to reuse uh, everything all the way back to the interactor or would that would that mean kind of rearranging a few other things as well I think you'd be able to reuse everything what you might be able or what you might end up doing just to make things simple is you might have a presenter or, or maybe an interactor but most likely a presenter that would know about multiple other presenters that it might use to format itself. So let's say you have the standard kind of split screen approach with a list on the left and a detail on the right. To control both of those separate screens, you might have a single kind of parent presenter on iPad that has access to the two different presenters for those different screens that are used on iPhone. And I think that's something you can do, which is okay, that you're creating a new class and composing it from the two other presenters that are used more on, on iPhone. And you could follow a similar pattern with the view itself when you have a single view controller that contains two separate view controllers. And, you know, that, that kind of stays consistent there. And the interactors you could probably most likely use unchanged because what those are really doing under the hood is doing things like managing access to data and gotcha. making requests and things like that. So that that's the type yeah. of stuff that's unlikely to change anyway. Yeah, and go, going back to that thing of like they're the kind of the representation of a like a use case or a user story. The use case is the same. You want to transfer funds from checking to saving. It's just the UI for that. The way you achieve that goal would be different on an iPad versus an iPhone. Right? Yep. Does Mutual Mobile do most of their apps using this architecture? At this point, yes. So I think uh, maybe, Jeff, you want to go into a little bit of the history behind this, but we've been certainly using this for over a year now on projects internally. Yeah, the way it came about is, yeah, going back to Uncle Bob, he has a video series called the Clean Code Video Series, and one of the things he talks about in there is the notion of this clean architecture. And when, and when I saw that, it became apparent that it does make you know, TDD a lot easier, which is, historically has been something considered very hard to do on iOS, t- typically due to the massive view control problem. And so, yeah, for me, uh, trying to implement clean architecture, which is Viper is our implementation of uh, or applying the clean architecture to the iOS environment and frameworks. To me, it was really just a means to uh, understanding how to make better use of TDD in the systems yeah, I think that was definitely where it started to take off a little bit is certainly in the community, you could tell that the iOS community was getting a little bit more serious about testing in general, but also TDD going back, I think around two years ago, that really started to, to take hold. And we were looking at that internally and trying to figure out how to apply that to our projects. And we went through a lot of different efforts trying out all sorts of different testing frameworks, whether it was GH unit or using something like OC mock or trying out completely different types of testing using like UI automation or KIF or, you know, even Kiwi is another one that we tried out. And the testing frameworks were all great and helpful, but certainly the way that the app is actually structured and architected tends to matter a lot more for how easy it is to test versus what framework you were using. So, I think a lot of it was just our internal figuring out how are we going to write code that's more testable. Yeah, I can I can imagine because most of these are just regular old objects. It's way easy to test, and you and you've got this nice this passive view thing, which just slices out any of the frameworky stuff, so that you don't have to deal with that in your test code. With this architecture, the view part becomes super duper skinny, right? The stuff that's actually involved with kind of Cocoa Touch frameworks, or sorry, with UI kit becomes very skinny. Is it even worth writing tests at that point, or are the views so kind of dumb that you can just test them at a higher level? Yeah, so by the time you get to the view interface, I mean, so to me, one of the benefits of TDD is it helps you drive out the interfaces of your collaborators. And so while you develop the interactor, it's sort of, you sort of drive out the interface that you need for the presenter, and then as you implement that, you sort of drive out the interface that you need for the view. And so by the time you get to the view, there's there has no more dependencies, so you could stop there. I mean, a lot of times I will continue to write tests like to make sure that it communicates properly back to the presenter so that when you tap a button, I'll, 
I'll write a test to make sure that it actually calls the appropriate method on its presenter. But that is is probably less necessary. Yeah, I've found those types of tests actually pretty valuable. It, it seems pretty redundant to you know make sure your connections are tested and that kind of thing. It seems very simple. But when you get into a piece of code and need to change it and refactor it, or someone else that hasn't worked on it before yeah. does it, you know, it's yeah. easy to, it's nice to catch those changes right away. Like, oh, I didn't hook up this thing versus it's in a different screen that only happens when these certain conditions that you don't really run across. So I've always, I found kind of testing views, kind of the connections between the view and the view actually pretty valuable. And it certainly does serve as good documentation having those tests. Like, this is how you expect the view to behave. Yeah, I've, I've had the same experience of being kind of surprised because it seems, I felt like really kind of like a bit of a TDD kind of dogmatic zealot doing it. So I stopped for a while to see what would happen. And it turns out that I accidentally break stuff quite often when I don't have tests. <laughs> <laughs> and the feedback no. loop is kind of worse when it's just like randomly crashes because I renamed, you know, the thing that the nib was trying to bind to or whatever. Yeah, it is nice to, I've noticed I spend a lot less time in the simulator. Because I, I spend all my time hitting Command U, so by the time I've developed the interactor and then the presenter and then the view, at the end of all that, I'll finally get around to running the app in the simulator, and it usually works the first time because all the tests all the way have told me that it's going to work. We don't believe you. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to ask if you, for an organization that may not fully adopted testing and may not be sold on it, how would you approach them and sort of convince them that that this, this is the right way to go, both in, ter- both in terms of Viper and in terms of TDD? That's a good question. It's, it still can even be a challenge internally to get everybody sold. I think I finally understand why it can actually save you time in the long run. It's, it's certainly easy. I can see why people think spending the extra time writing the tests will actually take you more time. But I think it's you're just trading off that time. You know, like you're not spending as much time in the simulator or in the debugger. Uh, and so that time you save not running the simulator all the time to drill down 10 screens deep to get to the screen you're actually working on, that time is what you spend instead writing the tests. And then the benefits are you get a better design system and you also have a nice regression suite so that when the changes come along later, um, it's easy, it will be easier to make those changes and know you aren't breaking anything. And if you do follow TDD and you all refactor, after every, every time you get a test going green, if you refactor, then you always keep the code clean. So then when you do have to make that change three months from now, the code is in a good state. Uh, so it's easy to find we need to make that change. Yeah, it's a very common anti-pattern when you're trying to start, you know, testing your apps to not refactor after, after you've written your tests. Yeah. You know, refactor your code and also refactor your tests so those are yeah. clean as well. Because yes. if you don't do that, then you have two messy code bases and your tests really don't help you at all. To me, refactoring is the fun part. That's where you got, get to, uh, when you see the code actually getting prettier and prettier, to me, that's rewarding. But I can see why people uh, easily skip that stuff. But yeah, uh, although yeah, for sure, I don't want to mislead people. Doing learning TDD is hard, and it does take a lot of practice. But if you stick with it, it is definitely worth it in the end. Yeah, I found. I mean, even if I'm not writing tests for a project I'm on, it has improved my approach to writing code. So I'm writing better code automatically, even if I'm not specifically writing tests. Yeah, so a side benefit which isn't always thought of. No, it definitely changes your thinking approach to code design. I think both the act of writing tests, the the training of learning how to write tests, and also learning how to write clean code in general, even if you're not doing it at the moment, it definitely helps you think through, because you, you follow the same thought process of thinking through the edge cases and the scenarios that you would be writing tests for anyway, so... I think certainly the tests pay off on, you know, projects that you're going to be working on for a long time and going to be maintaining for the long haul. It's definitely worth it and it pays off. But even if you're just working on something small for yourself that is, isn't going to be maintained long term, it can still help you save a little bit of time there by um, just making it easier to work on for the short amount of time that you're working on building the first draft. Nice. So getting back to like Alondo's question, like convincing people to go with TDD. Does Mishu Mobile do mainly like work for clients where you're kind of handling the entire development cycle? Right. So we do custom software for other people. So um, whether it's building a new version of an existing app or building a completely custom product from scratch, um, we kind of cover the whole gamut there. And We've really done it all different kinds of ways here, whether it was a project that was started from the get-go 
with a TDD style approach. Certainly we've done a couple of banking and finance and healthcare type of products. And so I think those are in particular kind of prime candidates for that style. And I think, um, for something that like a banking app that is going to be so large and complex, but also need to support a rich user experience, you kind of intuitively grasp that, you know, having tests and having a really robust clean code base would be nice to have. But until you actually see the final product and see that the code base is still easy to change and easy to interact with, I think that's kind of when you really understand the full value is seeing what it's like at the finish line. And, you know, you, anybody can imagine the effects of working on a poorly designed code base that's that large. But once you see it actually well done, I think it, it's, it can be very eye opening to everybody. I think that the whole organization can learn from that kind of success. Yeah. One of the kind of groups I see that kind of adopt TD are companies like yourself where they, you know, they do developments for other people and they can kind of define saying, Hey, this is how we develop software because it's more reliable. That's one way. Another group of companies that are accepting of TDD on iOS or maybe bigger ones that do TDD in other areas. But I, I don't see it very common where, you know, you have some random iOS developer saying, hey, we should do TDD and having that that work. I think there's a lot of resistance to it. Yeah, I think the main argument that I would make for it is um, you start to realize when, once you've been developing on iOS for a while, I think that early on people have the impression that, well, this is just kind of baby software, right? It's just something small. It's just in, in your pocket. It's it's not a big deal. It's It's low cost of ownership, but you know, the the longer the platform has been around, we see that that's really not the case that, you know, every year we're seeing rapid improvement and change and innovation from Apple on the side of updates to the iOS operating system. And you see that if you're really serious about having a product that exists on the app store, that it does require continual investment to keep it updated. And it's, it's not just a write it once and leave it out there for five years and expect it to survive, that it is going to require continuous work and upkeep and taking the time and putting the thought in to building a reliable code base with a clean architecture and hopefully also with tests is going to make that easier to maintain over the long term. Yeah, I think uh, one issue that can make it harder for like uh, like any developers to adopt is the fact that they're sort of wearing all the hats. They are the uh, developer and they're their visual designer and the interaction designer and maybe even the business designer if they're writing their own apps. And it's easy to blur those lines and not realize which hat you're wearing at any given point in time. So I guess if you did adopt something, try to adopt Viper, it would just sort of encourage you to be more explicit about which role you're fulfilling at, you know, at any given point in time while you're developing your app. And it's also about where do you invest your time learning something new? Like, are you going to invest a few months learning TDD or a few months learning iOS 8 extensions or something else? Like, that's um, some of the feedback we get internally. It's just like, where do I find the time to learn this new development methodology as well as everything that's coming out every year that's new on iOS? And that can be a tough question to answer, too, but... I think that, you know, one thing that's great about TDD, at least, is it's something that applies to all platforms and technologies that, um, you know, it's, it's something, it's a, it's a practice that once you learn it on iOS, you could apply it just as well on another tool chain. Or if you learned it before, likely you'll be able to apply that just as well to iOS these days, given the tools that we have. So I think that's one positive. It's, it's a technology or it's a bit of a training that you can do for yourself that will make you just a better all-around engineer. So when we're talking TDD, are we talking like the strict write your test first approach and let that affect your design? Or is it more of a relaxed use to the term? I follow, I guess, in the strict sense where I will use the requirements uh, given to me to, uh, I'll first write some tests that express those requirements and then to get those tests to pass, I'll uh, drive out the design and I, I follow sort of the mock roles, not objects philosophy uh, by the guys that wrote the Goose book, you know, Growing object oriented Software Guided by Tests. And so as I understand that, oh, I need some collaborator to help me out with this implementation, then I'll start to create mocks at that point to implement that uh, the interface that is just now growing into existence. 
I'm curious, do you do the kind of the inside out or outside in kind of thing that they advocate in the Goose Book where you start with like a high level test that fails and then kind of spiral into doing a bunch of lower level tests that fail or because I've found that challenging in iOS just because it's harder to write those higher level tests. Yeah, so right now I probably do more of a inside out, but I would like to get to a uh, outside in approach by you know writing these high level starting with these high level acceptance tests, which I think then becomes acceptance test driven development. And as you say, it's hard to find good tool chains to do those high level acceptance tests. I'm starting to explore fitness which lets you, you, you know, use wikis to create your hot, your acceptance tests, and then you automate those, and then you would fall into a TDD loop to satisfy one of those failing acceptance tests. But that I'm sure that will be a long journey. So actually, that kind of makes me think of a wacky idea of things you could do if you once you have this uh, Viper-like approach where you have this very clean. One of the things I really like about this is it's very clean separation between the view the view layer sorry i'm trying to think of the right word to to use the the ui kit stuff and the rest of the application like that ui kit the stuff that knows about ui kit becomes very very skinny right like it's the opposite of a massive view controller it's a very very skinny view controller could you just replace the view implementation with a driver like a, a window driver in martin fowler lingo and actually drive the whole application so have the entire app running top to bottom all of the everything else the real implementation of things but just the face of the application kind of replaced with a test driver and do some acceptance testing that way yeah i think that'd be certainly feasible it's like uh your presenters only tip they know nothing about the existence of ui kit but they certainly deal in foundation objects so your presenter knows about formatters and strings and numbers and sure you know, and all that. Yeah, and so since you have a just a nice interface or you know, in, in the terms as a protocol, um, yeah, you could easily just rig yeah, you know, have your factories if you want to load up the app and have your factories create instead of UI views, they could be effectively yeah, your test runners. Your your test runner could basically load up the presenters and interactors and wire them together and then just drive the you know, said I've Entered this value where I've said I want to transfer the value, transfer funds. And yeah, so then you could actually have the actual presenter and interactor logic run as your test. It would be interesting to see that. I, I've, I've worked with similar, similar but very different, I guess, frameworks or methodologies in the past where we've actually just, we've, we've had that same, like, very strong separation between UI kit and the rest of the app, but we went even further and just replaced the rest of the app with uh, JavaScript runtime instead. And and one of the really nice benefits of that is that you can test, do, like, really high-level, almost poking the UI type acceptance tests. And the, because you've got this really, really aggressive segregation between the UI and the rest of the and the real application... It's possible to do that, and it seems like if you follow this fiber architecture, then you'd get to the same place where you could just pretend to be have you know test drivers, little test drive things that pretend to be the UI that pretend to be those views, and then you can test everything else exactly the same as it would be in production, as it were, in quotes, but without having to deal with all of the the really fiddly, annoying stuff of acceptance tests, which is driving UI kit. Yeah, we'll have to certainly dig into that a little more. That'd be pretty interesting. Yeah. So I don't know if anyone asked about this, but does Swift change the conversation at all? One of the things that we did is after Swift was announced, we rewrote the sample project in Swift. And I think um, that was certainly interesting for me to see. I think that one of the things I'm super excited about with Swift is kind of the lightweight structs that are also a little bit more interesting in terms of they can have methods and so on and so forth. So I think the structs fit very well into some of the like data transfer objects, for example, that Viper tends to make heavy use of, that a lot of those feel very natural as Swift structs, which I think is really great. Yeah, I think this, the structs are definitely interesting. The type safety, I think, is most likely a plus when you have as many layers as you end up with in Viper. I think the type safety will more likely help you solve more problems than it would cause since it's always possible that you could slip up and have something come through one layer that's the wrong type for something else that was expecting something different. Certainly your tests could also fix those problems, but 
never hurts to have a little bit of extra layer of support there. So, uh, yeah, I think um, we're certainly pretty excited about Swift here, as I'm sure uh, most of everybody else is as well, and uh, looking forward to seeing what it's going to be like for Viper. I think, uh, you know, we'll most likely end up having to really build a whole project in Swift to see how it's really going to play out. I think certainly the biggest concern right now is the fact that there's no access control. There's no private protected public right now in Swift. Uh, that's something that they've promised is going to be added, hopefully before the final version or the 1.0 version ships this fall. That would definitely be something we'd like to see, although um, it does support protocols, which is something that Viper does tend to make good use of. So certainly possible to use Viper with Swift, just uh, not ideal until we get a little bit more access control. Can you elaborate on that a bit? That's I'm actually slightly surprised to hear that because I, I, I feel like there's a strong correlation between people who are into Uncle Bob style things and maybe, I guess maybe I've got more of a background in Ruby where people don't really get into public-private stuff anyway, but what's the concern there with Viper and private method? Yeah, I just tend to write lots and lots of private methods. So yeah, I'm going to write lots of really short methods that just do one thing. And that sort of leads to just make a distinction between high-level policy and low-level implementation detail. So all your traditional public methods, those should be written in terms of the high-level policy of what you're trying to implement. And then they'll end up calling just one or more private methods to actually implement the individual steps of that policy. Yeah, and I, if all your methods are public and swift, then it's easy to maybe call the methods that you shouldn't be calling. Yeah, I think it's less about trying to prevent access to some methods, but also I think it's more about making it clear what the public is... public API. Yes. Right. I guess I suspect that, may, well, maybe I, I haven't used Swift a lot in anger, but I suspect that because writing Swift code is going to be more pleasant than writing Objective-C code, just in terms of the noise, I think what we might find is we start writing lots of little classes. So that stuff that you don't want in your public API would become a different class that you're using, like that stuff that right now is in the private bits of your class. See lots of smaller classes. With Each class obviously has its public API, but the higher level classes don't expose the lower level classes that they're using. Maybe. I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> yeah, it'll definitely be an interesting journey to get there. It's a useful dream, at least. Yes. <laughs> it might be nice. <laughs> I was wondering, you guys talked that you do a lot of mocking. Are you seeing any mocking frameworks or any activity on that with Swift that's going to change a lot of things? Certainly is. I have not actually seen anything yet. Yeah, I haven't n noticed anything either. So I don't know if the, I'm sure this problem has been solved in other statically typed languages, but it seems like mocks are easy to deal with in a more dynamic language like Objective C. So we'll have to see what Swift comes up with. Yeah, most of the, the goodness of like OC mock and things like that are, you know, the Objective C runtime things, the dynamically related stuff, which makes it very nice to write tests for. But yeah, the static type and I think the type system itself is, by the runtime, how they create the structs is more analogous to C++ with your virtual tables and things like that, which you can kind of mock in C++, but it, it's difficult. So I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with that. Yeah, yeah, I'm a little nervous. Or I may just have to go back to manual test levels and just write your own spies and things yeah. like that. I think I read somewhere that they're going to, for stuff where you don't have to do interrupt with Objective-C, there's not even dyna dynamic lookup at all. It's just, it's like hardwired at compile time, so you've just got no option in terms of mocking things. But maybe so, I misread it, that. There's, there's always an option, just how deep do you want to go? Yeah. I guess there's hope, you know, Apple seems to be more involved in, you know, like XC test. They're continuing to expand that, so maybe they'll add their own mocking framework to the XC test library. I don't trust Apple to get that right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I agree with you. I mean, it, they've had, how long has OC, OC Mock has been around for like 10 years and they've had 10 years to, Apple love to reinvent tools that are already there and working. They decided to build their own CI framework. They've had 10 years to build a mocking framework and they haven't done it. I'm, oh. Yeah, I'm not sure they'll do it. And if they do, I'm convinced they'll get it wrong. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There's my micro rant over for the day. Oh, there you go. I got one last quick question. Maybe, hopefully, it will be. It won't be too long. So, playing devil's advocate here, and I, I very much am playing devil's advocate because I, I actually really like some of these ideas. But I also know 
that there's a pretty large contingent of the Apple developer community who want to do as much stuff the Apple way as they can. And if I was to pretend to be one of those people, I would say, well, I have to do all of this extra, all of these extra stuff and make all of these extra things. Like, why can't I just use view controllers and stuff like Apple wants me to do? Uh, Oh, and also I don't believe in testing, so don't try and convince me of that testing nonsense. Is there like a, a good like argument beyond the testability to sell someone? If I wanted to sell someone on this, to counter, like, I guess to counter the thing of like, that I hear a lot when, basically when I talk about architecture in general, which is just like, oh, there's so many moving parts. It's way simpler if I just build everything into the view controller. What's the techniques have you guys found for arguing the case for this? Well, certainly one of the cases that you can make is if you're working with a development team, like if it's more than just an individual, mm. then the benefit of having everyone doing something in the same way can pay off because that way when let's say person A implemented something for the first time, but person B needs to go back and modify it or fix an issue, then if everyone is, you know, agreed on a architectural style of what goes where, then it can be a lot easier for person B to come in and still be really effective. So I think that's, you know, one and obviously the case could also be said for uh, <laughs> if everything's always in the view controller, it's easy to know where to fix it. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> it's all in one place. <laughs> right. But, you know, I, I think we've all seen where that breaks down. It, it doesn't take a whole lot of experience on iOS to see where the pitfalls are with that kind of approach. I think most people are starting to, to grok that. And so, you know, once somebody, I think, has that epiphany, um, that that's just not the right way to do things. It, you can make a proposals like this that, you know, I think once you try it out and see it in practice, it's really not as much of a learning curve as it sounds. Like looking at the 4,000-word article on Objective-C.io, it can seem like a really daunting process to architect an app this way. But when you look at it in practice, it's really only something like six or eight classes in a little group in Xcode. It's Really, and all of them are pretty much NS objects or UI view controllers already. So, you know, once you actually implement it in practice, it becomes a lot less intimidating. Yeah, at a certain point, if a 3,000 line view controller doesn't scare you, there's probably no help. (laughs) (laughs) It's It's perfectly fine to have something this big, you know. At that point, you just don't even bother trying to convince them of anything. Yeah. No, what you do is you wait a few months and then come back and try and convince them. Yeah, how's that been working out for you? <laughs> <laughs> you can't just one little feature. Um, no, I just broke five different things. All right. Well, sounds like we've uh, pretty much wrapped this up. Should we get into the picks? Sure. Sir. All right. Alondo, what are your picks? Uh, okay, I have two picks this week, um, and there are tools that I use fr- frequently. Actually, I used them both this morning. Uh, the first one is Charles. It is a, a web debugging proxy application, and basically it's a, it's a good tool for sort of monitoring all your HTTP, SSL, HTTPS traffic between your client machine and Internet. You can also filter through your mobile device as well, which is what I u- use it quite a bit for when testing. Uh, and then the second one is a lot of times I just need to test REST API calls separately, so I use a tool called Rested. And it allows me to just create uh, simple payloads to make requests and see the responses so I can make sure that things look the way that they should. There, it's pretty lightweight, and it's a really easy app to use. It's in the Mac Mac App Store. Those are my picks. James, what are your picks? Okay, since we got into the, uh, the TDD mode, I'm going to pick two things that really helped me along the path to learning how to write unit tests for iOS developments. One is a screencast from John Reed where he talks about test driving UI view controller. And before I saw this, I'm like, how would you even test your views? That I had no idea how that would even work. So he kind of goes through it. It's about an hour or so. And I haven't looked at it in a while. So I assume it's still good, but it definitely helped me way back when. My second pick is a book, which is, as far as I know, the only book on testing iOS stuff by Graham Lee, Test Driven iOS Development. It's a great book. It's not too long, and it helps you figure out how to test things like you know, scroll views and things like that, table views. How do you test those things? The good news, if you're sw- transitioning to Swift, none of these guys use mocking frameworks, OC mock or anything like that. So their concepts will translate pretty cleanly to Swift. So those are my picks. Very cool. Um, I'm going to give Pete a few more minutes and uh, do some picks of my own. 
So I have been, as many of you know, I've been listening to several audiobooks. I'm a big fan of Audible, so I'll probably make that a pick. And then I'm going to pick a few books that I've read lately. Uh, one of them is uh, Wheat Belly. I have a brother and a sister that are wheat intolerant. And I had been feeling kind of sick off and on and just not good for a while. And I have type 2 diabetes, and I think some of it was that. But it had been steadily getting worse, and I just couldn't quite put my finger on what the issue was. And so I decided to try going off wheat. And I've been feeling quite a bit better. I've been off wheat for about a week and a half now. And so I read this book, Wheat Belly. It was really interesting. So, you know, go ahead and read that. He does cite some studies, you know, related to the stuff, but... I haven't actually looked up the citations and read the studies, so, you know, take that with as much salt as you want, but or go check out the studies if you're inclined to do that. Another one that I've been uh, really enjoying is uh, The Way of Kings, which is uh, the Stormlight Archive, I think is what it's called, by Brandon Sanderson. So I'll put links to that in the show notes as well. And finally, I'm not sure if I picked it last week or just mentioned it when we were talking about all the tools we use, but I'm really, I, I started using redbooth.com. I think I mentioned that it has a Gmail plugin, and it has just been very, very helpful. So uh, I'm going to pick that as well. And finally, my last pick, or I've been working with Mandy, who's my assistant for quite a while now, and we were talking about putting together some retreats for coders, you know, where you basically come and, you know, you can go do activities in the area and spend some time hanging out and coding with other coders and stuff like that. And she has just been tremendously helpful with that as well as with everything else. And so uh, I'm going to pick DevReps. If you're looking for assistant or some kind of help with your business, then I can't recommend them highly enough. It's devreps.com and we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Pete, you have picks for us? I have picks. We've been running like a, a, a Swift learning group in my office and we had someone come in last night and talk to us about kind of functional programming in Swift, which was really interesting. So I guess I'm going to pick functional programming in Swift or using functional kind of programming paradigms in Swift as, as one of my picks. I'm going to include a link to one example of that, which is using optional. Um, so the optional thing, which everyone is really excited about in Swift, great thing, uh, using it as a, as a real monad. I'm not going to try and explain what a monad is, but it doesn't act as a monad by default, but it's actually really easy to make it into a monad using an extension. Uh, so I'll, there's a link to a little gist that shows you how to do that. My second pick around this kind of, we talked quite a lot about unit testing today, TDD. Uh, there's a website called iosunittesting.com. Uh, it's a good resource for kind of basic information. It's got links to kind of some books and yeah, a good resource in general, it looks like. Uh, and then my last pick is Adafruit's NeoPixels. So Adafruit is this really awesome company that lets that that sells kind of like electronic gadgets and gizmos, so Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and components for building your own electronical wonderness. And one of the cool things that they sell are these things called NeoPixels, which are these little RGB LEDs that you can really easily control and kind of change the colors of each LED individually. And um, it's hard to describe. Uh, how fun they are, but if you go and, and look at their at the Adafruit website, you can see some really cool examples of what you can do. And I just I'm picking those because I just built a really cool but pointless toy for my son using uh, these NeoPixels, which uh, he is enjoying a lot less than me. But that's okay because I'm enjoying it. All right, Conrad, what are your picks? So I've got to keep the beer pick tradition alive. So my beer pick is the five one two pecan porter. Um, which is a brewery right here in Austin, Texas. So if you're ever in Austin or around the central Texas area, definitely check out the 512 Pecan Porter. It's a very easy drinking kind of porter. It's got a darker feel and a nice pecan kind of flavor to it. It's uh, it's one of my favorite beers lately. And my second pick is uh, kind of jumping off of Pete's pick a little bit on functional programming with Swift. The uh, fine folks at Objective-C.io are in the process of writing a book on functional programming with Swift. And what's and obviously the book isn't done yet, but what's, what they're doing that's really cool is you can pre-order the book and they'll actually give you access in GitHub to their repository so you can have early access to read the various chapters and also comment and provide feedback on the book. So it's a really cool process that they're doing. And if you're interested in 
Swift in general and especially functional programming in Swift, then definitely check out that book. Uh, there will be a link in the show notes. And my last pick is a little bit different side of things from the technology side. It's something called the GORUCK Challenge. And it, the GORUCK Challenge is a sort of a team-based endurance challenge that is really kind of an event like nothing other. It's probably like nothing that most people have ever done before. So if you're looking for something that would really challenge you and kind of help you accomplish something that you really didn't think was going to be possible, then this might be the event for you. And I just completed my second challenge two weeks ago on July 4th. So I can definitely recommend it if, uh, if it looks like it might be up your alley. So go rec challenge. Cool. Jeff, what are your picks? Well, first, I want to talk about uh, Pete's pick of iosunittesting.com. That's actually written by my boss here, uh, Ron Lyle. So huh. good pick, good pick there. Pick your boss. I like that. <laughs> yes, I did it for him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so my picks, uh, Uncle Bob's Clean Code video series. Uh, he goes into a lot more depth on test driven development, architecture, design patterns, clean coding practices. They may not be for everybody's tastes. They are kind of real silly and funny and campy. And he has lot, uses lots of different characters, but they're a lot of fun to watch. For a book, I like uh, Agile Testing. Uh, a lot of it is focused on the role of QA in an agile development process, but it also talks about things like acceptance testing uh, and the the agile testing quadrant, which is all these different type, all the different spectrum of tests you could have. Even just trying to implement that, I think, will just make us a better development shop, whether or not we get there in the end. Uh, for beers, uh, I'm a devoted hophead, so I'm going with the uh, Hop Delusion from Carback Brewing, which is down in Houston. It's uh, over 100 IBUs and 9% alcohol, so it's, it's not, a, not a session beer, but it's certainly tasty nonetheless. And then also, one, one of the th- things I like to do for my different project teams I work on is I like to make a uh, homemade ice cream form because everybody seems to love homemade ice cream. And so the book I use most often is called The Perfect Scoop. It's an ice cream recipe cookbook, but uh, even if you can't cook, there's a lot of them that you just throw a few ingredients in a blender and whiz them up and then turn them into ice cream. So uh, it's got something for everybody. You definitely want to work on a project team with Jeff. Mm, ice cream. <laughs> Sounds delicious. <laughs> and, yeah, so there's my picks. All right. Well, thanks for coming, guys. It was a great discussion, really interesting stuff. Yeah, super interesting. Really great. If people want to follow up with you guys or Mutual Mobile, what are the best ways to do that? So uh, mutualmobile.com, go check out the website. And for me, this is Conrad Stoll, and I'm at Conrad Stoll on Twitter and ConradStoll.com. And for Jeff, if anybody wants to continue the conversation, you can email me at jeff.gilbert at mutualmobile.com. And say it's been a blast talking to you all. Yeah, it's been really fun. Thank you guys again for having us. Yeah, thanks for coming. We'll catch everybody next week. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more.